Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this wonderful morning. It is indeed a privilege and a joy to come into your presence, to be able to sit before your throne of grace. In the midst of this current epidemic, Lord, we thank you for your protection, for shielding us from all harm, from all infection, from all in diseases. We pray for those who are infected, we pray for the church members, we pray for our families represented even in this church. Lord, that your hand of grace be upon us all and keep us well, even as we keep our eyes on you. And this is what we intend to do this morning, on you and on your word. So speak to us, dear Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, we are now at chapter 5, but very quick recap. If you remember, uh, the five sections that are divided in this book of Matthew are as listed in this on this slide. So we are still on the first section, the king revealed, chapter 1 to chapter 10, the king revealed to Israel first. Then if we break it down, the next slide, chapters 1 to 4, the person revealed, which we have studied. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and, and then uh, he was, uh, then in chapter 3 he was water baptized, in chapter 4 he was tempted and as we concluded chapter 4, we had a quick, we had a quick, uh, let's have a quick recap or what we did last week. I, I can't remember if we covered this slide, but in essence, in essence, this is the gospel. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 15, verse 1, no, no, verse 45, and all captured for us, um, it is a good news. If we do a comparison, the first Adam, he was in a garden. And then, the last Adam, who is Jesus, he was in a desert. The first Adam was eating freely. He, it was a beautiful place, free from sin, and he could have anything he wanted. But the last Adam, as we studied last week in chapter 4, he was fasting, and he did so for 40 days. First Adam, he was in perfect condition in the Garden of Eden, in the presence of God. In the last Adam, it was a terrible situation, terrible condition. Not only was he in the desert, he was hot, he was hungry and cold in the night, but he was also bothered by the devil, by Satan. First Adam, he had a choice, and he <clears throat> made his choice to commit sin disobedience, disobeying the instruction of the Father. But the last Adam, this is the gospel, he conquered sin. He overcame sin. And because he did, so can we in Christ Jesus. So that was the person revealed, chapters 1 to 4. Now as we come to the next section, which is uh, chapter 5, These are the principles recorded for us. Chapters 5 to 7, it is, they are known as the Sermon on the Mount. And so, we will cover that starting from today and the weeks following. And it is a bit lengthy, so I might not be able to complete a chapter a week. God willing, we can, but if not, it's okay. I hope you're not rushing for the train. So, chapters 5 to 7, they are known as the Sermon on the Mount. But you don't find this phrase in the Bible, Sermon on the Mount. But it was on this mountain. No one knows exactly which mountain. I've been to Israel quite a few times, and we have uh, been on a few of these slopes and some say it's here, some say it's there and then that's where I taught and I showed them uh, 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 from the Word of God. 
what Jesus taught and, and what he did even in, in that place. But we are not certain exactly which is the place. But it was there that he delivered the greatest sermon of all time. The greatest sermon and the longest sermon that Jesus delivered. And it was, and it is known as the constitution of the kingdom. Now, every nation has a constitution. These are the rules and the regulations in which the country is run. Even in this church, uh, in any church, there will be a set of constitution, the do's and the don'ts, the laws, the regulation. Otherwise, we come in and we gather as one group and we have no rules. Hokkien is no tingu, right? No government. Do anything you like. No. This is the constitution and, and Jesus laid it all down. You can also find another record of this Sermon on the Mount in Luke chapter 6, 17 to 49. Now, you will find similarities but not exactly the same. The principles are there but it was a different occasion because Jesus couldn't have just preached once and then he stopped because he was moving and he moved to a different location and there was a different crowd in fact that one in Luke chapter 6 if I remember correctly it was like in a valley not exactly on the mount but still the message was similar to this and the principles therein now there is a, a, a wrong practice by quite a number of people uh, they take the Sermon on the Mount as if it is the Gospel and this is what they live by and they think that by living this as a Christian, I'm on the way to heaven. It is not. If you look from chapters 5 to 7, you do not find the Gospel of grace. You do not find the Gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not about salvation. Oh, then it taught me, uh, you know, I should be meek, I should be poor in spirit, I should be humble, I should hunger, then I'll be blessed. Uh, tell me, teach me not to judge others so I'll be judged. Yeah, you slap me, i let you give you the other face. Uh, don't defend myself, show mercy. And some people claim that I am living according to the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm on the way to heaven. It is not. I will show to you, I will show to you that this constitution is for the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven. This constitution is for the kingdom of Israel. When Christ shall come again into the future during the millennium. At this point, when Jesus was addressing them, they were not righteous. So the message is to point them to Christ. That full righteousness is fulfilled in Jesus Christ and in the future when they shall... That's why you see it is they shall be... It is uh, pointing to the future. In the future, they shall be. So the Christian will ask, why is it not for me? If you look at just this chapter, chapter 5, verse 3. You look at chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oh, sounds like my portion. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Yeah, very good. Now, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And many times we have read this. Many times Christians have read this. And then they go on. Uh, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, and so on. And they say, everything is for me. Look at verse 5. For they shall inherit the earth. Now, question. When you accepted the grace that Jesus laid before you, you accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. What is the promise? What is the promise? You shall be here or you shall be there in heaven. 
heaven. Our home is in heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And when He shall come again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we shall be raptured, right? To remain here, no, to go to heaven, to be with Him, to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we will come back at the end of the tribulation and to be with Christ and to rule and reign with Him. And if you remember all the learnings that we had, there will be those who took the first flight and they will be with the Lord Jesus, the new heaven. But in Ezekiel we studied, there were people who will be saved during the tribulation and they will also enter into the millennial. But they missed the first flight and their residence will be where? On earth, the new earth. And they rebuilt the temple, remember? And they still restore the sacrifices, but the sacrifices is not pointing to the future when Christ shall, shall be sacrificed. But it is remembering, like what we are doing, the Holy Communion, observing it every month. We are looking back. So in the future, the Jews and those who were saved during the millennium, during the tribulation, they will also be worshiping the Lord in the new earth. In the, te in the temple, but they are looking back. Okay? So, you and I, we shall inherit. We are heirs and join heirs with Christ and we are going to heaven. These people inheriting the earth, they are the Jews. So, while we have got principles to read from here, uh, do not think that this constitution, this uh, a sermon, it's directly applicable to you. We can find application, but this is intended in the context for the Jews. Okay? You must get this right before we start. So it is for Israel, not for the church. It is the law for them during the millennium. Because they are not perfected yet. But if, because until now, most of them are still not born again. But when they do, they will inherit all these promises as we shall study shortly. B attitudes. It is also known as B attitudes. So the key word you see there is attitude. So it is the attitude. It is not just the action. It is not that you don't have action. You do need action. But first, the attitude. Because your action is dictated by your attitude. Some people hump ching pen face, go to work, bad attitude. You, you know the performance will be poor. But some come to work and in spite of the challenges, still smile and, 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 and press on. Their performance will be really so much better. So it is the attitude, the attitude. The Gospel, as I mentioned, you can read chapters 5 to 7. It is not about salvation. It points to salvation though, but it is not about salvation. You want to know about salvation, it is in 1 Corinthians, as I mentioned earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve, and so on. Brother, put your head over. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So, that is a summary of the gospel, but you do not find this, you do not find this in the Sermon on the Mount. So, is there any application for us? Yes, secondary. But directly, primarily, it was targeted at the Jews. 
So we will still study, it is still relevant. Like you say, hey, the law is not relevant. No, it is still relevant. But the application is different. But it is still relevant. So the purpose, the purpose of this Sermon on the Mount, what was Jesus' intention? Number one, to expose our sins. To expose the sins of the Jews. Because the Jews thought that if they religiously and piously follow the Ten Commandments and the 613 laws and whatever else that the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, but in particular the Pharisees, impose on them and then the scribes can come up with the Talmud, the instructions for life. And they are so extensive. They, they, they really impose on your life. And you feel like as if there's a yoke on your neck. And it is so burdensome. You cannot do this, you cannot do this, and you cannot take how many steps, you cannot carry so much things on, on the Sabbath. That's why Jesus said, Come, take my yoke. My yoke is easy. But the yoke of the Pharisees and all this, they are so heavy on you, they are putting a, a, a burden on you. So, by this sermon, Jesus was telling them that all this that you are trying to follow, is all this are insufficient. You cannot meet God's standard. And because you cannot meet God's standard, you have sinned. You have fallen short of the glory of God. So by not missing, like not meeting the passing mark means what? You fail. La. Simple. So to expose the sinful nature in the Jews, of the Jews. And to point us to Jesus. And to point them to Jesus. They also need Jesus. Though they are the chosen people, but they too must accept Jesus. The first time Jesus came, they rejected him. But the next time, when he comes, only, only those who have accepted him will be part of his kingdom. You follow me? And so that's where the Sermon on the Mount lists all these principles for them and for us as well as we find application. To show a way to happiness. Because... Truly, the Jews are not living joyfully. They, I mean, when you are living in a very regimented environment, you, 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 you find yourself so limited and there is no freedom of expression because joy comes from within. But this, as Jesus taught and shared with the people of Israel, is to point them and show them a way to happiness. To show us how to live a life pleasing to God. Not please man, but to please God. So, now we come, we narrow down. I will, okay, not yet. We, we, we look at still the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 to 7. So, it is so long, covered over three chapters. So, if you divide it further, there are sections that relate to ourselves. There are sections of this that relate uh, us to the law. The subjects of the kingdom. Subjects of the kingdom, be mindful. Who are the subjects of the kingdom? The Israelites, the Jewish people. So for them, is how this set of constitution relate to us. How this set of constitution relate to the law? Because Jesus will say, the law say this, but he says this, right? Thou shalt not kill. But then Jesus said, but if you, if you even are angry with your brother, you have committed murder. So, the constitution will, will help the Jews to understand the relationship, the, the relevance of the constitution to themselves, to the law and to God. To God. So chapters five, it's chapter five is about self and the law. Then when we come to chapter six, it is about the relationship between the Jews 
and God. When we come to chapter 7, it is relationship between us and all the people of Israel and others and men. Men and men, men and God, men and law and men and men to himself, of himself. So if you follow this table, it will be easy for you to understand the different sections and then you study, study them uh, in detail. Now, even more, just to look between chapters 5 and 6. Righteousness that we must possess. Righteousness that we must have. This will become clearer after we have covered chapter 5. These are the principles. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger. These are the principles you must have. But having it is not good enough. When we come to chapter 6, you, these are the principles of the righteousness that you must practice. You follow me? Some people only got hate knowledge, but it is not translated into action. So chapter 5 is what you need to know. Chapter 6 is what you need to practice. So, we are now ready for chapter 5. Well, the simple outline we have here is the attitudes. The attitudes that should characterize kingdom citizens. Kingdom citizens. Verse 1 to 12. The witness of the kingdom citizens, salt and light, which are very familiar. Verse 13 to 16. And then kingdom principles in relation to the law and the prophets. 17 to 47 and then finally in verse 48 the objective is be perfect therefore even as your father which is in heaven is perfect how to be perfect in Christ Jesus we are not there yet we are work in progress so let's look at chapter 5 verse 1 and seeing the multitudes, that means a lot of people. Does it mean all of them are believers? No. Many of them were just curious lookers. And they must have heard, they must have seen. And then they, they are curious, they want. Of course, many among them are probably unwell. And they came. And seeing the multitude. He went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. What Jesus was doing was he was getting away from the crowd so that he can have his time with his disciples to teach them. It is quite unlike some uh, ministers, some preachers. You know what they are looking for? They are looking for attention. They are looking for attendance. They are looking for, wow, you know, the bigger the crowd, the better. Book the national stadium. And, and they just want the crowd. But Jesus, when he wanted to teach, he separated himself from the multitudes, from those who are just curious, and he went to a place where his disciples could be with him and where he could teach them. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated on a mountain, that's why his sermon on the mount. And when he was seated, now this in Israel, those who are teachers, they sit when they teach. Those who are preaching, like in the synagogue, and so when they are preaching, they stand up. So what I'm doing is quite biblical. <laughs> But for those who have been with me since uh, 12 years ago, uh, then I had a back surgery. So after the back surgery, I cannot stand too long. Then my back will really get hurt. So that's why my kind uncles and aunties, they say, hey, elder, sit down, sit down. So I've been sitting. And I find that it's biblical. Okay. And when he was seated, his disciples, not the multitudes, 
Who came to him? His disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth. Then he opened his mouth. Then you're wondering, why right then? It's so redundant. How else do you talk? <laughs> you have to open your mouth, right? But it is just a, 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 a way of writing by the Jews that he spoke. Okay? And he said, then he opened his mouth and taught them. Now, as I taught you last week, in, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, the sequence was teaching, preaching, and then healing. So teaching is addressing the familiar. Means people who are familiar with the scriptures. Preaching is preaching the gospel, the good news to the unfamiliar. People who do not know. So right now, he was addressing his disciples and he wanted to teach them. So, and taught them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now the word blessed, the essence of which means happy, happy, joyful. I mean, when, when you are receiving the goodness of God, you're having the time of your life, you are just pleased with God and God is pleased with you and everything that is going on around you, you are happy, you are joyful, you are blessed. So the first of this is looking at, that is intended for the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit, meaning people who are spiritually in poverty. They, they are lacking knowledge and the things of God. They are just in the flesh. So, but because you are spiritually poor, you're, you're, you have a future. But there are other things that come later. But let's say we look at... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. So in chapter 6 of uh, 2 Corinthians, he listed down the marks of the ministry. And as we come to verse 10, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. So Paul is saying, yeah, in the flesh, in the circumstances that I'm in, sorrowful. Maybe in this crisis, some people are caught in a very uh, uh, unfortunate situation, they've been infected, and, and they can be believers. Like we saw in Grace Assembly and, and, and another church, the Life Church or something. Yet always rejoicing. As poor, yes, poor, lacking some of the material things, some uh, comfort in life, yet making many rich. Paul, Paul, Paul went around uh, as a uh, someone with you know a, a, a convoy of cars, flew in an aeroplane, landed in in Europe, and then had his uh, hotel and all bogan and he was doing that kind of evangelistic outreach? No. He was actually living very simply. He was a tent maker who provided for his own ministry. And he was actually being very careful because he had enemies who wanted his life. And he was cold, he was hot, he was bitten, and, and all this. Poor. Yet making many rich. Wow, you poor, how do you make other people rich? Rich in God. Because when you have Christ, you have everything. And so, even though Paul was poor, but he made many rich in Christ, rich in the Spirit. As having nothing, physically having nothing, yet possessing all things. So you see, the whole one of the great objectives in the ministry is to help people who are spiritually poor, poor in spirit, 
to make them rich. Rich in Christ, possessing everything. Sorrowful, but you shall be rejoicing. So, blessed are the poor in spirit. And for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, blessed are the poor, referring to who? To the Jews present. When Jesus was addressing the disciples, referring to the Jews who were present. They were poor. They were ignorant. I mean, you look at the disciples. They were really just fishermen. They were un, uh, ignorant. But in the course of being discipled by Jesus, they become enlightened. But even when Jesus was with them, they were still blur. They did not understand. And it was only, it was only after Jesus died and Jesus resurrected and then Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit came wow then Peter stood up and preached the first sermon right but before that even Peter said Jesus you shall not die far be it from you right and then after uh, Jesus was resurrected even Thomas Hey, I won't believe until I see and I touch. We all will say to Thomas, we, you know, we will say to Thomas, Thomas, uh, if I took your place and spent three years with Jesus, I'll know everything. Really? You could be even more blurred than Thomas. But it is a process. It is a process. So, what I'm saying is, he was addressing the disciples, right? And they were spiritually poor. But they came to the right place, they came to the right person. For theirs is. So for theirs is, to the Jews who are present with him, then he said, for theirs is, means what? Now or future? Future. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In future. The humble. Yeah. This was spiritually poor. But the new ages, new age people will think, Will teach you, I am God. Okay. Right now, I'm God. Close your eyes, shut off your mind, and, and think that you know you you are able to control and and get things in, in the way you want. I'm God. We are not. We come to God and say, I am nothing. My vessel is empty. Fill it. I am spiritually poor, poor in spirit. So blessed are those who are poor in spirit for theirs. So likewise, likewise, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, as Paul said, from sorrow to rejoicing, from poor to rich, yeah, lacking, and then possessing everything. That is your portion and my portion as well. But our kingdom, we don't need to wait for the kingdom in the future. For them, they are waiting until the millennial, right? For us, now, where is the kingdom of God? Here. You receive Him, you are in His kingdom. Kingdom of God. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed for those are those who mourn. And these are people who come to the realization of the sinful nature that they are in. And so they are mourning. They are mourning. And they are longing for forgiveness. And they are seeking forgiveness. And that is present. But for the future, they shall be comforted. They shall be comforted in the future by the Holy Spirit. But for now, and even as they mourn, as they long for forgiveness, they shall be comforted. We look at Revelation 17, verse 7. Revelation 17, let me see. No, 7, chapter 7, verse 17. For the Lamb, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to the to living fountains of waters 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So this is the great multitude, a multitude from the great tribulation. So is this referring to the church? Is this referring to the church? Because before the tribulation, we would have been raptured, taken away. So after chapter 4 in Revelation, you will not find mention of the church taken up. So after that, the tribulation, these are the Jews, these are the people who bought, and others who were saved, even the Gentiles, who were saved during the tribulation. And they go through a very rough time. Persecution. But the Lamb of God who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living waters, the living fountains of water. That is what? Eternal life. They will not die. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So they mourn because they were mourning. But who will comfort them? Jesus will comfort them. So, again, remember, this is pointing to the future for the Jews, the kingdom to come. Verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. Who are the meek? The meek are those who do not assert upon you, assert their authority. They do not impose on you. They do not oppress, suppress you. More so, like Moses, it is like strength under control. Not like, I mean, was Moses, did Moses ever get angry? Yes. And then he struck the rock disobediently. Yeah, he could also show his strength. But other than that, now for that, he paid the price. He could not enter the kingdom. He could not enter into the promised land. But other occasions, he was a meek person, strength under control. And that is Old Testament. What about Jesus? What about Jesus? Jesus was also a meek person. If you look at Matthew 11, verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so we've got great examples before us, and so we ought to emulate them, follow them. And right now, as he was addressing, addressing the disciples, the Jewish disciples, he said to them, Blessed are the meek. So we look at Psalm 37. Verse 5 to 11. Psalm 37, verse 5 to 11. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in Him, he shall, and He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. This doesn't speak of a man who is meek, right? So cease from all this. Be meek. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. They shall inherit the earth. Not heaven. They shall inherit the earth. And this is addressing who? The Jews. For yet a little while, and the, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. Repeat, but the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. 
So this verse tells us clearly, clearly that these beatitudes are intended primarily for the Jews because our inheritance is in heaven. Okay, one more verse before we move away from here. Okay, we look at Isaiah 57 verse 13. Again, this is addressing the Jews, Israel's futile idolatry. So you look at verse 13, Isaiah 57. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. Because the Jews, at many points in their history, they were rebellious. They worshipped idols, just like the Gentiles. So God said, when you cry out, let your idols deliver you, let them help you. But the wind will carry them all away, carry all the idols away. A breath will take them away. It is effortless. You don't even need a tsunami. You understand? It just, God said, a breath will take all the idols away. But he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land. But he who puts his trust in me. So the Jews must put their trust in God. And they shall possess the land. The land is where? Here or there? Here, right? The earth. And shall inherit my holy mountain. Where is that? Zion. Jerusalem. So where is that? Here. So, I think, I hope you are very convinced now that uh, this is intended primarily for the Jews. But if you want to stay, we won't stop you. We will take the first flight, see you again. Okay? <laughs> Verse 6. Now, you notice that the first three, the first three are talking, I mean, so far, so far, all this, uh, all this uh, beatitudes are referring, pointing to, you are poor in the spirit, you are mourning, you, you are uh, meek, it's like you are empty, like you are nothing. But as we come to verse 6, you shall be filled. This vessel is an empty vessel. We cannot go on empty. So as we get rid of all the unwanted things, we want to be filled. Filled by the Holy Spirit. So now we look at verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Who hunger and thirst. So what is your appetite? What is your appetite? I see people who, who are hungry for you know those kind of uh, kids and uh, they play those kind of cards uh, then they go and buy and collect all the cards right or don't know what kind of uh, which i also don't understand some people are crazy about lego toys and i tell you adults uh, some people are crazy about star wars collection and then they go and buy adults uh, they go and buy so what are you hunger I mean, you are, what are you thirsting after and what is your hunger for in life? But Jesus is saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. So far everything is hungry, hungry, empty, meek, weak, poor. But now you shall be filled. You shall be satisfied. So we look at this, we are again putting our mind that this is for the Jews. So we look at Old Testament first. So Jeremiah 31, 33. And if you remember, in Jeremiah 31, this section here is about the New Covenant. You see, even in the Old Testament, God spoke through Jeremiah, his prophet, that there will be a new covenant coming. And one day, that new covenant can also be the possession of the Jews. So you look at verse 33. But this is the covenant 
So before that is the old, but now come to the new. But this is the covenant that I will make. So future, future, I will make with the house of Israel after those days, after the past. I'll make a new covenant, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. So, I put the law in their mind and write it in their heart. That means what? The word, uh, the word which they memorize, the Pentateuch, and they also follow the Talmud, and they, they do it so regularly, they just can repeat. If you go to the wailing wall, they stand there and then they, they keep themselves awake with their physical uh, action and so on. Then they, they read and read. They know the word outside, but they have not internalized, they have not eaten. Jeremiah 15, 16, eat the word, take it into your system. And God said, in, in the future, the day will come, I will put their law eternally, my laws in their minds. And they say, hey, but in the future, the law not relevant. Like some preachers will say, Old Testament not relevant, or they say, the, the laws are not relevant. But God is say, I will put. So the laws are still relevant, right? Thou shalt not kill, relevant or? Thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not cover, thou shalt not commit adultery. Still relevant. But instead of just reading it outside, but put it inside and write it on their hearts. For us, it's a hard issue. Whether we are for Christ or not for Christ, righteous or not righteous, it is a hard issue. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaker the right? And I will be their God. So sad. I thought God would say, I'm already their God. God chose them, right? But they did not choose God. You follow me now? God chose them, but they did not choose God. They were quite adulterous. But God said, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Means right now, they are not yet. They are not yet. Because they do not know Christ. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother. Say, know the Lord. Know the Lord. Right now it's, oh, know the Lord, know the Lord. I'm just you know, going through the thing. But eventually, because it is in their hearts and in their mind, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, because they shall be filled. They shall be filled with the righteousness of Christ. Like we are filled with the righteousness of Christ. We know Christ. It's not like we know about Christ. We know Christ. For they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity. So, right now, not yet. In Christ, they shall be forgiven. And their sin, I will remember no more. So, back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 2. 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. For us, for us, as you and I hunger and thirst for righteousness, you shall be filled. And you know what will come for? Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. What is Galatians 5 verse 22? The fruit of the Spirit. The, the fruit is not fruits, huh? Fruit. This fruit is so wonderful. It got so many flavors. And the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. Means what? You cannot, you cannot put anything uh, to it. No. Okay. If you do this, uh, up to here, you are loving your brother, you are loving God. But if you don't, you are not loving, not loving enough, or not loving. You can't put a law to this. 
back to here. Now we go on to verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So, if you are merciful towards others, you will also receive mercy. And that is one thing. Mercy is one thing we desire the most. God's, the man's greatest need is forgiveness. We need forgiveness. Otherwise, we are doomed. And God's greatest gift is what? Mercy. And He forgive us. And He forgive us. And so, likewise, if you, if you, if you read the history of Israel, um, actually, it is human. The big fish eat the small fish. Right? The rich bully the poor. And we have studied enough in the gospel, the unjust judge, the rich, put casting down the poor. And God, from Genesis onwards, uh, kept reminding the people of Israel, don't forget the poor and the orphans and the widows and the strangers in the land, right? So be merciful to them, be merciful towards others. And then you shall obtain mercy, for they shall in future obtain mercy. So, application for us. So you look at First Peter. First Peter chapter two verse nine. Ah, okay. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. You all know this, right? Now, verse 10. Who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. In the past, you had no mercy, you had not obtained mercy, but now, now, now that you are born again, now that you are new, chosen generation, a royal priesthood, holy nation, special people, out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now you have obtained mercy. Show mercy. Show mercy. You see, for us, for them is blessed are the merciful. So you show mercy to others, towards others, you shall obtain mercy. But for us, because we have obtained mercy, because it's by grace, what? Old Testament is by books, right? You do, do, do. Then see whether you score enough points. But New Testament is all by grace, not by works. So you obtain mercy, right? Freely. Now, show mercy. You see? You see the difference? Different. Okay? So, one more. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. According to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit that did the regeneration, the overhaul by His mercy, by His grace we have been saved. So show mercy. Verse 8 Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now, why is this so special to the Jews when they hear this? Because the Bible said, who can go to the mountain of God? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, right? You know the verse, huh? who can ascend the mountain of God? The holy hill. Clean hands, outside or inside? Outside, in external. Clean hands and pure heart. Now, the Jews are very good with the outside. If you go to Israel, you see at those restaurants, there will be extra separate uh, uh, crucible on the side and, 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 and a water tank and so on. And then they wash their hands. They, on the outside, they are very observant, compliant. 
So Jesus wasn't addressing, he's, he was addressing Jewish disciples, right? He's not concerned about the external. He went straight into the internal because he did not say, blessed are those with clean hands. You are already clean. You always keep clean. Ceremonially. But Jesus went straight internally. Blessed are the pure in heart, inside. So it's not just clean hands, which is good, because then you don't get coronavirus. <laughs> but it is inside as well. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God. So Psalm 24 verse 4. This is about the King of Glory and Kingdom. Okay, verse 4. Okay, this is the one that uh, I just quoted. Verse 3, Psalm 24, verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sought deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of His salvation. Right, so, is it applicable to us? Of course, of course. Jesus already said, out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaker, it is a heart issue. Verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know who was saying to them? Who was addressing them? The Prince of Peace. The devil is the Prince of this world, but Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace was addressing the Jewish disciple, telling them that blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers is not just having peace. Wow, oh, I'm so peaceful. Praise the Lord. No. Go and bring the gospel to others. Go and point them to God for the Jews. Point them to God. Return to God because they have run, they have run away from God. For us, the unbelievers, point them to Jesus so that they will also have peace in them. Because peace can only come from the Prince of Peace. So it's not ask you to go and look at people, fight, and then you try and be the peacemaker not about that kind of peace, but to introduce them to the peace that will rest in their heart in the person of Jesus Christ. So blessed are the peacemaker. Anyway, during the tribulation in the future, there will be lots of uh, people suffering. People are lost. So the Jews who will be evangelizing at that point in time, they are those who go and bring peace to them in their heart, they will be blessed, for they shall be called sons of God. So we look at Romans chapter 5 this morning. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. For us, application. Do we have peace? Then I ask, have you been justified by faith? Justified means just as if you have not sinned. That means you've been forgiven by faith in Christ Jesus. Therefore, having been justified by faith, that means you are saved, forgiven. What do we have? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to wait. We don't need to wait for the kingdom of heaven in the millennial to have peace. You and I already have peace. Okay, one more. Galatians 3.26 Galatians 3.26 For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. You are all. He was writing to the Galatians, to the church. So if you are sons of God through faith, then you have peace. Peace in the person of Jesus Christ. So blessed are you. For they shall be called sons of God. Yeah? 
Paul also wrote, you are all sons of God in verse 26, Galatians chapter 3. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, looking into the future, during the tribulation, they will be persecuted, the Jews. But actually, not only them, right throughout history, the Jews have always been persecuted. Example, the Holocaust during World War II. Persecuted. Right now, is there anti-Semitism? It is still existing. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. So, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Not maybe, will suffer persecution. Jesus also told his disciples, in this world there shall be tribulation. But, worry not. Jesus said, I have already prayed for you. So, it is a very challenging place that we are living in. Right now with the coronavirus, uh, I think it's just a sampling of the last days. More to come, things will get worse before they get better. In the recent years, we saw SARS, H1N1, uh, the, what, what mad cow disease, and Zika, uh, and all this. Things are just getting more earthquakes, more tsunami. They are all mentioned in the last part of Matthew. So these are the last days. So we ought to be prepared. But blessed are those if you are persecuted. And for righteousness sake, not because you did something wrong. Not because you did. If you did something wrong, you deserve the punishment. But it's not. But you did it for righteousness sake, for Christ's sake. You will not bow your knees to the devil for yours. So telling the Jews that you are being persecuted now, but in the future, in the future, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile, that means insult you, and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And if you care to read the history and read some of those uh, articles and so on, even at the United Nations, any accusations thrown against Israel. And you know, most of them are lies. Verse 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, if you were the Jew uh, listening to what Jesus just said, okay, blessed am I when they insult me, when they persecute me, say all kinds of evil against me, but you, because I am suffering, I'm, I'm being persecuted, I will get a reward. And you know what kind of reward you will get? You will get the same reward as the prophets who were persecuted in the days of old. In the Old Testament, many prophets came and they were not having a good time. They were persecuted. Look at Jeremiah was put into the miry mud, right? They get their rewards and, and prophets reward who are God's messenger. God told them what to say and they faithful. They will all be well rewarded. And you, because you suffer for righteousness sake, you will also get the same reward as prophets. Wow, so good. Yes, this is to encourage them. So you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians, no, chapter 11, verse 22. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22. Now, when Jesus came to verse 11, he actually changed the pronoun. And so this one, he was telling his disciples, hey, uh, before this, uh, you look, verse 3 to verse 10, what was he saying? Are those, are they? Am I right? Pointing to 
others. But when he came to verse 11, uh, the pronoun changed of blessed are you. Before then, the disciples are ah, talking about them, talking about them, talking about them. Then Jesus reversed the thing, now changed. Now blessed are you. In other words, telling them, you will be persecuted. You will be suffering. In fact, in fact all of them except John, they were beheaded, sawn into half, Peter crucified upside down. Except John, beloved John. He died in old age. Okay, so back to here. So, verse 22 to verse 28, suffering for Christ. And if you go and read all this, uh, the laboring, the, the journey, the perils, the sleeplessness, nights, and the coldness and nakedness, and so on, all this sufferings that even Paul himself experienced. And you know, he will get his reward, just like the prophets. So, I'll leave you to go and read this uh, and on your own about the suffering, even as recorded by Paul. So we pause here for a break and then we will resume later.